Welcome to our University of Nebraska Feed Yard Extension webinar series. I'm pleased that you joined us online to uh, watch the video recording. I'm very excited about today's topic, uh, looking at uh, fly control and how that relates to what feed yards can do. Um, if you're watching this webinar and you would like to evaluate the program, we'd strongly encourage you to go to that website that's listed here, the go.unl.edu feedlot webinars, feedlot webinar spring 18, and, and give us feedback on our programming. Uh, today's topic, as I mentioned, is, is fly control and, and how that relates to feed yards and feed yard management. Um, our speaker is uh, Dave Boxler, who's located at the West Central Research and Extension Center. He's an extension educator focused on, on livestock entomology and has done a lot of work in this area of fly control for beef cattle. Thanks for doing this today for us, Dave, and look forward to your comments. All right. Thank you, Galen. And we will start right in with the, the type of flies that we do have at feedlots and confined facilities. Uh, the two uh, primary fly species are stable flies and house flies. The stable fly is a, uh, a species that was brought over about 250 years ago from the uh, uh, European countries and Africa countries, and we just have a single species here in, in North America. Uh, it is a very distinctive fly. It is a blood feeding fly and it's about a quarter of an inch in length and has a, a very distinctive checkerboard markings on its, on its stomach area or abdomen. Um, it usually feeds anywhere from one to three times per day and that is dependent upon the weather conditions. If it's too hot or too cold, it will feed uh, usually about one, one time, but normally two times a day. Uh, its lifespan is about two to three weeks and um, generation-wise, uh, it, uh, it can generate a population in about oh, uh, 21 to 24 days. Now, the mouth part of the stable fly is very distinctive, and here we have an excellent picture uh, that shows the, the mouth part, and uh, it almost is like a, a needle of a syringe. And here you see the inverted portion of the tip right here, and that's what penetrates into the skin and starts the process of extracting blood. And that whole process is very painful to animals as well as to humans. The life cycle, as I indicated, is anywhere from 15 to 20 days. It's a normal fly life cycle, so it consists of eggs, larva, pupae, and then adult. What's interesting about this fly is that it doesn't necessarily develop in straight manure it actually develops in uh, very wet organic material. And how it attained its, its name, stable fly, is that it was closely associated with uh, stables years ago when we utilized horses. And uh, also with the development material, uh, the spent hay and manure mixed along with soil provides a very excellent habitat for the stable fly to develop. The impact uh, economically uh, of the stable fly in feedlots uh, is significant. We have two impacts. We have an indirect effect, which is caused by the bunching of cattle, which increases the heat, heat stress and thus reduces weight gain. And then we have the direct effect of the stable fly, and that's the actual energy loss involved in the fighting of flies. Uh, what you see when you have stable fly activity in a feedlot, you'll see animals bunching and they'll be stomping their legs. Well, the energy is lost during the, the fighting process or the stomping of the legs. So there's been a lot of studies done here at North Platte over uh, many years and looking at average daily gain with varying population numbers. And over those uh, 17 studies, we found that average daily gain can be negatively impacted from anywhere from 2.9 to 20%. And certainly if you have five or more stable flies per leg, you're going to have impact on animal performance. Normally we see stable flies feeding on the front legs, but they can also 
feed on the rear legs as well as in the belly region of, of the animal. The other fly is the house fly, and it's a, a non-biting fly. Uh, cosmopolitan, it's, it's everywhere, and it's implicated in, in many different types of diseases uh, and affects uh, human habitation as well as livestock facilities. Its mouth part is really different than the stable fly. This is almost like a sponge. It's a sponging type mouth part. So it feeds on solid, semi-solid, and also liquid materials. And they range anywhere from manure, uh, animal feeds, sugars, human food, as well as garbage. So uh, that's where it uh, picks up a lot of bacteria and it does vector a number of uh, serious uh, diseases. Here is an example of housefly feeding. They kind of congregate in large numbers and uh, really become a strong nuisance in a uh, fly uh, in a feedlot setting. The life cycle is much, very similar to the stable fly. It has uh, eggs, larva, and three instar larvae uh, stages, as well as the pupa and adult. Its life cycle is much shorter, anywhere from an average of 11 to 21 days, but can be as short as 10 days depending upon the uh, temperatures. Certainly the housefly has the potential to reproduce exponentially as this uh, graphic shows and uh, we can see huge numbers in the feedlots uh, during the latter part of the uh, summer season. A lot of times we're asked, how can you tell the difference between a stable fly and a house fly? Well, this uh, picture shows the, the stable fly here with the checkerboard part of the abdomen and then the mouth part sticking out compared to the house fly. The house fly is slightly larger. And if you look at the, the uh, uh, ventral sides, here you see that the, uh, the stable fly is much different with that protruding mouth part, which is very distinctive. Also, when the stable fly is resting, it usually has its abdomen or stomach down and it's sitting at an angle. Very, very distinctive. The impact of houseflies in feedlots uh, really uh, points to uh, annoyance to cattle and to the, the people who live nearby a, a feedlot. Uh, we did a study uh, back in the late 1980s at North Platte where we looked at uh, varying numbers of houseflies on uh, average daily gain and with a population of 49 flies per animal, we did not see an impact on average daily gain. It was more of a nuisance issue. And when, when you get high numbers of houseflies, especially around the feed bunks, and that's where houseflies will tend to, to congregate, they will uh, be a nuisance to animals and animals will bunch and not go to the, to the uh, feed bunk. Also, as I mentioned earlier, they can transmit many animal and human diseases. Uh, there's been a lot of work done with uh, E. coli over the last few years and it's certainly the fly has been implicated in uh, vectoring that particular bacteria. And especially uh, to the neighbors of feedlots, uh, many nuisance complaints have been uh, raised over the years and primarily it's, it's due to the, the house fly because house flies and stable flies tend to move. They can migrate from one location to the other so that certainly adds to the nuisance issues that we do see with uh, both fly species but especially the house fly. Well let's look at the various uh, major development areas within a a feedlot where both of these flies can be found developing. Certainly the fence lines that you see here is a primary area during the summertime where manure, uh, soil, and other organic material gets put together and kind of uh, gets uh, uh, in line with the, the feed uh, with the fence. And um, uh, this can attribute to, uh, uh, I'll say about, uh, 8% of where the stable flies and other flies are developing. Here in this uh, picture to the right, you see the edge of a, a feed uh, bunk apron. And this is where a lot of the stable fly development does occur in a feed lot. 
up to 62%. Pen corners and around gates also uh, can accumulate fly developing materials and uh, will harbor both the house fly and the stable fly. Also underneath feed bunks is another site where um, fly development does occur with both species. Wet areas around water tanks, and certainly we've seen this issue this spring where we've had a lot of uh, rain and, and we see this site fa fairly common. So it, it's good to try to reduce those wet areas around the water tanks if you can. Drainage basins can become a problem during the, the summer season. This picture right here shows a, a basin and another issue along with a, dr a drainage basin is the accumulation of vegetation. If this vegetation is left un uh, well uncut, it will grow and actually harbor resting sites for flies. So it's good to clean these basins out on a very regular basis. If uh, it becomes too wet and you can't get in there with mechanical devices, you can flood this area with about a half inch of, of moisture to kill the developing larvae that uh, may be in this particular basin. Edges of stored manure and silage are also a prime area for both housefly and stable fly development. Uh, many times silage will be covered and uh, also the edges of uh, stored manure can be a site where flies are developing, especially the wet areas. Edges around uh, hay storage uh, are certainly a prime area for stable fly development, and also damp areas under round bales can be problematic during the uh, summer season. There's some cultural control uh, steps that you can take to help reduce fly issues. Certainly, the primary uh, step is to maintain dry conditions. Sometimes that is impossible. Certainly like the weather conditions we've uh, experienced over the last couple of weeks have certainly compounded that issue, but keeping the lots dry is certainly uh, a key priority. Also providing enough slope or good drainage to those pens, a minimum of three degrees is really required to help maintain that runoff. And then a key uh, component is also Stock your pens to the maximum. The more animals you have in a pen, you increase the trampling of the manure pat, which also uh, compromises uh, fly development. So stocking your pens to maximum is a, a real benefit. Uh, here again, clean pens. And uh, many times uh, we can't spread the manure on fields, so we stack it. So if it is stacked or mounted, you need to have steep sides and you need to have that manure packed very tightly so water cannot penetrate, so it can run off. And ve keeping vegetation around the lots mowed short is also a, a key component because uh, tall vegetation offers a resting site for both house flies and stable flies and can become a very important key in reducing fly population numbers. We talked about uh, the drainage areas and debris basins. If they're too wet for cleaning, flooding certainly can uh, impact the developing larva. And usually a half inch to an inch of water is sufficient for drowning the, the developing fly larva. Sanitation is by far the key to maintaining and controlling flies in feedlots. Uh, proper animal waste uh, management is essential. And uh, feedlots uh, and dairy should be designed to ease cleaning and providing good drainage. Uh, cleaning the pens in the spring and fall uh, is important uh, in reducing the potential fly developing sites, especially uh, along the, the fence lines and in the aprons uh, of the feed bunks. Along those areas, uh, cleaning should be done uh, at least uh, every two weeks scraping that material and either spreading it out thinly to dry it or mounting and packing it would be a, a very beneficial uh, aid in reducing uh, fly development with both species. Insecticides is uh, another uh, means of controlling flies. Um, 
they have been used over uh, decades in, in feedlots. And um, we have several different types of uh, application methods. Uh, one uh, is space sprays or area sprays. And that is uh, traditionally uh, accomplished with the aid of a mist blower, uh, which uh, is uh, using a high uh, speed squirrel cage to deliver uh, a, a fine mist over the, uh, the animals as well as resting sites. Um, one key uh, component when trying to address resting sites is that you can actually use a mist blower to target resting sites such as windbreaks, the tree lanes and weeds, and even crop fringes, because if a crop is close to a feedlot, stable flies especially will move to those shaded areas, the underside of leaves, and uh, rest there as they're digesting their blood meal. So using that strategy sometimes uh, reduces um, stable fly numbers more than actually misting over cattle. We have a number of products listed uh, uh, available for this particular delivery system. And beside each product, I have the mode of action group number uh, associated with that particular compound. And we'll talk more about the mode of action group numbers uh, toward the end of the program. I might note that two of the products listed here, uh, Rayvap and Vapona are restricted use pesticides, and you need to be a licensed applicator to purchase and use those products. Residual sprays can be a very uh, important tool in uh, focusing on both house flies and stable flies. Um, with stable flies, after they take their blood meal, they will seek a shaded area to digest their blood. And the sides of buildings, especially on the east and north side, as you see in this picture, is a perfect place to target your residual sprays. These are normally applied with a hydraulic or compressed air sprayer, and they can be uh, on the shaded sides of feed bunks, fences, buildings, inside of buildings, especially for house flies. During the evening, house flies will go inside buildings to rest. So if you target some of those inside areas of buildings, you help can reduce the, uh, the population of house flies. Residual sprays are effective for about seven to 10 days, depending upon their exposure to sunlight and certainly to rain. Here we have a number of residual sprays that are available for uh, producer use. And again, I have the associated mode of action group numbers with the, the products listed here. Larvicides used to be a, uh, a tactic used to control flies and feedlots over the years, but we've kind of gone away from larvicides. Uh, they are applied to fly development areas, so you have to target those sites and use a, a hydraulic sprayer to deliver these types of products. Uh, we have two products available, uh, Neparex, uh, which is available in the spray as a granular, and then we have Raybon, uh, 50% wettable powder that are used. Baits are commonly used in feedlots, but they only target house flies and blow flies. They will not work against stable flies. They can be available in dry or liquid formulations. You should keep them out of uh, the way of children and animals. And um, if you rely solely on baits, they will not control a house fly population at a feedlot or dairy, but they can help reduce numbers. So baits have to be incorporated with other control strategies. Here's a list of baits that are, nor that are actually available for use by producers. Again, I have the mode of action group numbers associated with these products. We do have a number of feed additives or oral larvicides, which act uh, and as the animals intake uh, the products that are mixed with rations, um, they are passed through the animal into the manure and um, attack the growing larvae that are in the manure. We have two products available, Clarifly and Raybon available for use in feedlot situations. One last um, control agent that is uh, 
actually uh, seeing more popularity over the last few years is a biological control agent uh, using the pteromalid wasps or parasitic wasps. And wasps, uh, female wasps, will deposit their eggs in developing pupae, fly pupae, both house fly and stable fly. The developing wasp in, will feed on the inside or actually the fly developing within the puparia and kill the fly. Uh, parasites alone may not be able to control fly populations, but can be effective when used as an, uh, in an integrated pest management program. We have one other control agent that can be utilized not only for reducing fly populations, but also mo monitoring fly numbers. And those are traps. And we have a, a series of four different traps available here. These are primarily at least the first three, the Williams, the Brosi, and the Olson are designed for uh, stable flies. The Farnham trap is designed for house flies and blow flies. However, if you paint the Williams, Brosi, and Olson traps white, they will also attract house flies. So we do have some physical control uh, available for producers who would like to uh, try that strategy. Well, getting to uh, the last segment of this presentation, and that is uh, resistance management. We have an increasing issue out there with fly uh, resistance to a lot of our products. And we have now developed a, uh, an insecticide mode of action groups, which designate how the insecticides used. So in order to manage resistance, we have to rotate to or through different mode of action groups. And here is pictured a number of the different products as, along with their associated mode of action group numbers. So in order to manage resistance, producers have to go from one uh, group number to another, uh, hopefully throughout the fly season and certainly uh, year after year. Uh, here's another uh, set of products that are available uh, with the associated mode of action group numbers. To manage resistance, you have to uh, rotate uh, products uh, not only through the summer, but uh, year after year. Don't use the same product uh, year after year or else you're gonna run into some problems. So here's a picture of my mentor, Jack Campbell. Uh, this was taken many, many years ago. And uh, his philosophy back uh, in the 1970s and 80s was sanitation is the key to good fly management. And that philosophy still remains today. Certainly key on sanitation and incorporate these other strategies in a good IPM program to manage fly control at feedlots. This is my contact information. If you have more questions about feedlot fly control, you can access me at at uh, 696-6721 or by email at dboxler1 at unl.edu. And thank you for watching and please evaluate this program at the following website. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, one of the questions I have is that many producers have pasture cattle too mm -hmm. and or are watching this and may not just have a feed yard cattle interest, but thinking about pasture cattle sure. a brief description of, of are there differences in control mechanisms for pasture versus feed yard cattle well yes there are uh, we have a different fly complex in the pasture we will have horn flies which are a blood feeding fly that remains on the animal almost continuously it's a much smaller fly than the house fly and the stable fly we also have a face fly which feeds around the face of the animals. And then unfortunately, we also have the stable fly that is now bothering a lot of our pasture cattle throughout not only Nebraska, but the entire Midwest region of the United States. So we have three fly species to deal with. Uh, the strategies are a little different in the pasture uh, because you cannot control sanitation out there. So we employ uh, insecticide air tags. We employ feed-throughs or oral larvicides, we do animal sprays, porons, injectable uh, uh, products are available, 
and uh, also uh, dust bags and oilers. So the strategies are a little bit different because the fly species are also different. And I'm just curious, there probably is a reason, but why is the horn fly and the face fly not, a, not, not prevalent in feed yards? Well, uh, the, uh, the horn fly can be a problem early on in the season. If you have a pasture that uh, parallels or is adjacent to your feedlot, they will come in and feed, but they need a, 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 a solid manure pat to complete development. So the manure in a feedlot gets trampled and you don't have an intact manure pat to complete both horn fly and face fly development. Very good. Thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate it. And uh, as he alluded to, we'll post this and, and you're watching online. Uh, feel free to, to evaluate the program and, and give us your feedback. Thanks again, Dave. Thank you.